You've been writing this week on your website uh, about this hedge fund in Chicago that's made a lot of money, in effect, betting against the American dream. What, what was that? Magnetar is a hedge fund, which means that other people gave them money to invest, and their job is to make as much money as possible. And these were the smart guys in the room. They saw that the system was broken, and they found a specific way to exploit it. And they knew that they could go, for example, they could go to Wall Street banks, and the banks would collaborate in makes, making these extremely toxic securities because they knew what the bankers' incentives were. They knew that the bankers' incentives were to, to do the deal, to do the transaction, to get the fees up front. And they knew that there was nobody watching out for the investors. There was nobody watching out to make sure that the securities they manufactured were actually good securities. But essentially what they were doing is they wanted to short the housing market. And they shorted the market in such a way that they actually made the problem worse. Because what they did is they encouraged, they tried to create these very toxic securities explicitly so that they could then, then short those securities. And that's why, in a sense, they were, they were shorting the American dream. But what the real story of Magnetar, I think, is that they were explo exploiting a system that was deeply broken. So we like to think that the financial system we have in Wall Street are set up so that as people try to make lots of money, they are, they are indirectly helping the economy by making sure that capital goes where it's needed most. most. What the Magnetar story shows us is that this is a, a casino where you can make money you can make money exploiting the weaknesses in the casino, and it has nothing to do with the American dream. It has nothing to do with making sure that, that capital goes to the places where it's needed most. And I have to say that we owe a great debt to ProPublica and Planet Money and This American Life for uncovering the story. Yep. Public Radio's uh, excellent program, This American Life, did a terrific broadcast on this subject based upon the ProPublica investigation that you've uh, talked about. And there's a song in it that I have to play for the two of you and for my audience. Take a listen. Step one, we read a check for $10 million, hand the check to a Wall Street bank, and ask them to make us a CDO. Step two, they create the CDO using risky stuff, very risky stuff, extremely risky stuff. Step three, other investors commit hundreds of millions of dollars to the CDO. Step four, we bet against the CDO using a credit default swap. Step five. The housing market crashes, the CDO's value drops to zero, our bet pays off, and we make hundreds of millions of dollars, and before you can say step six, we're rich! We're gonna bet against the American dream, we're gonna be on the winning team. Purchase risky debt on a massive scale, then place a bet that the debt will fail! Hundreds of millions for Magnetar The economy collapsing like a dying star No one will know till it's on NPR And who cares? It's time to hit the town This sucker could go down The housing market's losing steam And all we gotta do To make our dreams come true Is bet against American dream. You're smiling, James, but is it really that funny? Well, for decades we've been told that Wall Street and financial innovation were promoting the American dream, and what they've, I think what the show and the song have really hit the, hit the nail on is that, uh, in fact, you could make even more money betting against the American dream, and that's the kind of system we have today. My bumper sticker from this, right. and I hope it does become a bumper sticker, is Trust me, I'm a banker. <laughs> uh, I mean, you need to break through. There's a level of, 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 of progress here, Bill, which is when people can laugh about it, when people can break it down into pieces. When, you can, when you've got the 60-second version and you can hammer that and people understand it, then you're starting to fight back. This is about ideology. This is about belief. This is about these guys are smart. These guys are well-paid, so they must know what they're doing. And that's wrong. You wrote on your website this week about how J.P. Morgan Chase... Uh, lost $880 million on one of these kind of wacky, obscure uh, uh, deals, but the executives still paid themselves millions of dollars in upfront fees. And you conclude the bankers placed a ticking bomb on their own bank balance sheet. It exploded, and personally, they still made money. Exactly, because this is an example. So this is from the ProPublica investigation of Magnetar. Essentially, the, the bankers at J.P. Morgan Chase involved in the transaction created a new CDO, a new collateralized debt obligation, which was very, very toxic. And either they knew at the time it was toxic or they should have known. I have no way of knowing. J.P. Morgan decided to hold on to most of this toxic product they had, they had built, a billion dollars worth of, of toxic product. And then 
when the market collapsed, it turned out they lost $880 million on that position. So if we think about it, there are really two possibilities here. The bankers involved in the transaction either really thought that this was a good product and a good investment, in which case they're incompetent. Or they, had, they may have had doubts, they may have thought it was toxic, but they knew that the way the internal systems at J.P. Morgan Chase worked, they could get the fees up front, they could get bonuses based on those fees, and leave the bomb for later. Somebody wrote on your blog this week, if I were to buy an old house, make some cosmetic improvements that mask an underlying rot, got my insurance company to write an exorbitant homeowner's policy exceeding any liens against the property, then burned it down, wouldn't that be fraud? Did you answer this guy? <laughs> I haven't. That would, would, that would be fraud. That would be fraud. <laughs> so explain to me how you managed to lose $880 million on your own company's money to make a quick buck for yourself, and you get away with it. Well, I think that there are laws in this area. So for any securities, there has to be, for this type of security, there has to be a document which explains the securities. And that's a document that you give to the investors who might buy them. And there are laws governing those. And if you put in facts in there that, that are materially false, that you know to be true, that is fraud. But I think the problem is that in, in many of these cases, I don't think that many of these people were criminals. I get a lot of criticism for saying that I don't think these people were criminals. But I think it's relatively easy to write these documents in such a way that you're not saying anything you know to be false. And so they pass through, they pass through any kind of, um, you avoid any possible criminal liability there, but yet they can be misleading in a way that encourages people to buy them. I, I think it's actually worse in some instances, Bill. Uh, certainly for offshore um, activities, Goldman Sachs was involved in hiding a lot of Greek government debt. They then sold new Greek government obligations to people in the United States, as far as, far as we, we understand it, um, and didn't reveal that they'd hidden the levels of, of the true levels of government debt. Now, that, that is withholding uh, material information. That's a violation of Rule 10b-5. And where is the legal process, you should ask, that holds them accountable for that? Um, I've talked to lots of very good lawyers about this, and there are many complicated stories about why Goldman Sachs won't face any civil action or, or, or criminal action. There are huge loopholes in our legal system with regard to financial services that need to be closed. There were some interesting hearings, as I know you saw, before the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, and some of the first, some of the most interesting uh, testimony came from the former honchos at, uh, at Citigroup, uh, Mr. Prince and Mr. Rubin. Take a look. Let me start by saying I'm sorry. I'm sorry that our management team, starting with me, like so many others, could not see the unprecedented market collapse that lay before us. My role at Citi, defined at the outset, was to engage with clients across the bank's businesses here and abroad. Having spent my career in positions with significant operational responsibility at Treasury and prior to that at Goldman Sachs, I no longer wanted such a role at this stage of my life, and my agreement with Citi provided that I would have no management of personnel or operations. But almost all of us, including me, who were involved in the financial system, missed the powerful combination of factors that led to this crisis and the serious possibility of a massive crisis. We all bear responsibility for not recognizing this and I deeply regret that. The two of you in charge of this organization did not seem to have a grip on what was happening. I don't know that you can have it two ways. You either were pulling the levers or asleep at the switch. How can it be that a Robert Rubin, former Secretary of the Treasury, pulls down $100 million as a senior advisor to Citigroup and claims he doesn't know the risk that was involved in what he was trying to sell to clients and, 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 and foreign officials? Uh, how can that be? I think there are two things. There's a, there's a, a, um, a narrow and a, and a broad view of this. The narrow view is, I think Rubin is actually not lying. I think it is true that Rubin did not know what the risks were, um, although he certainly should have known what the risks were. And that's because he was fully um, subscribed to this ideology that free markets are good, that, that the market will take care of itself. That, and he also suffered from a lot of the blindness that corporate officers and directors have. Corporate officers and directors manage these enormous organizations with uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of people, they have very little idea what's going on. They're getting their information from subordinates who are giving them a filtered view of the world.